Hello, everyone. I'm back. Sorry to say, but you're stuck with me again. So, hey, it's another Mondays with Monday, and we're looking at Jim Mundy, the historian for the Union League Legacy Foundation. So, uh, it's now February the 1st. Uh, so, where has this year gone already? Uh, but, it's, you know, I noticed so it's been a while since I've done something about the league building itself, or the house, if you will, for architecture, one of my favorite subjects. So I thought I would um, try something along those lines, but I think with um, a little surprise about what it's going to be. Um, well, I'll bet nobody can tell. So that means I've got to start the PowerPoint and I'm going to share my screen. Let's pull this up. All right, there you, now you have a clue. All right, uh, come on, let's go. And dogs, we did it again. I am still surprised that works. Okay lighting the league. Now, I'm not going to cover all the league and all the lights because that would take days to talk about. It'd be fascinating, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but instead, we're going to talk about a single fixture. And there it is. All right. Uh, this is a room that no longer exists because that part of the building no longer exists. This was uh, the assembly hall that was uh, the main ballroom in the, in the annex that was built in 1881. So this is an addition to the rear of the Broad Street building and it ran along the Sansom Street side of the building. Okay, and in that room, as you can see, is a wonderful chandelier. Actually, but we think of it as a chandelier, but technically this is 1882. Actually, well, the photograph itself is 1887, but that fixture was purchased in 1882. So guess what? It's not a chandelier. What is it? It's a gasolier because it was powered by gas, as was everything else in the city of Philadelphia, all right, at that point in time, unless we're still using candles, <laughs> in which case we're going to get a library, but that would have been a mess. Can you imagine trying to light that thing with candles? It wasn't going to happen. So, so let's learn a little bit more about it, all right? So actually, here's the floor plan so you have some idea about where Assembly Hall was. So on the right-hand side of the floor plan, you see the main annex listed, okay? So Assembly Hall was uh, on the second and third floors of the building, if you will. Okie dokie. All right. Uh, today, it's obviously occupied by Lincoln Hall. And on the first floor, it is where uh, 1862 by Martin Hamill would be located. Okay. To give you some idea geographically about the building itself. All right. So where did, who made it? This company here, Thacker Sons and Company from Philadelphia itself. All right. And here we have Benjamin Thacker. He was the Potter Familius. Uh, he started the company. Actually, he was born in Haddonfield, New Jersey, uh, another New Jersey guy. Hooray, hooray. Uh, in 1820, as you can see, uh, his first job was as a school teacher, and either he didn't like it or it just didn't work out because he then switched into the dry merchants field, as it was called back then in the 19th century. And he went to work for a company called Baker and Elliott, and they made light fixtures. And he was hooked because he spent the rest of his life making light fixtures. And uh, Baker and Elevit would, would evolve, evolve, forgive me, into Cornelius and Baker, which would become the country's largest light manufacturer. Okay. Remember the name Cornelius and Baker from our October program that featured Robert Cornelius, you know, the gentleman who took the first photographic selfie in America in, in 1839. Well, that was his father's company. So Cornelius and Baker. So amazing how these things, these dots all connect. So anyway, so um, from Cornelius and Baker, it went through a few more iterations. And then finally, it became uh, well, Thackeray and Buck. Mr. Buck retires and then it becomes Thackeray and Sons because Benjamin Thackeray had two sons, both uh, one of whom Charles would spend his career in the light firm. And the other son, uh, Alexander, instead of... Um, joining the firm, joined the Navy. So he spent a few years working in the firm in the, in the 1890s, but not very many. So, so there's Benjamin Thackeray. All right, now he would join the league in April, uh, April 15th of 1865, at the, you know, just as the Civil War was ending. His son Charles would join the league in 1869. As I mentioned, Alexander joined the Navy instead. Uh, but when he did come back to Philadelphia to help his father in the firm for about a decade in the 1890s, uh, he... Uh, was then appointed uh, to the ambassadorship in Berlin by Woodrow Wilson in 1913, and he never came back to Philadelphia. Right? And actually, he died in 
Paris, and that's where he's buried. So, uh, but there have been two other generations, though, of Thackeras as members. So there have been four generations of Thackeras as members. The most recent one, Charles Van Zandt Thackera Jr., uh, resigned from the league in 1960. So they were members all that, all, you know, for almost 100 years. Pretty neat. So anyway, so those are the Thackeras, okay? And this was their company headquarters, uh, 1524 Chestnut Street. You can see a building designed by Willis Hale, uh, who did some of the most eccentric architecture in Philadelphia. Of course, that building no longer exists, but, it, but it, they were right around the corner from the lake house, if you, or right down the street, actually. Okay. All right. So here we have, here we have uh, assembly hall. You can tell by that coffered ceiling, illuminated and decorated for a Founders Day event in 1903. So uh, the room is obviously there is it's still that uh, the annex still exists. Uh, it has what predates what we call the Trumbauer sections of 1910 and 1911. So this would be the middle section today, if you will. Uh, but just look at that fixture, just all lit up, uh, and of course decorated with all those flags. So, uh, so you could do many things with those fixtures in those old days. I'm not sure we would do it today, <laughs> but you could certainly do it back then. But it was two years later, in 1905, that according to the annual report, uh, the Pennsylvania Brass Company was hired to come in and they cleaned the fixture. They silver plated the fixture, all right, and then they also rewired the fixture, which would imply that it had already been wired for electricity. Because in 1888, electricity first became commercially available, shall we say, in Philadelphia. Uh, the league paid its first electric bill in 1889, so we had electricity. Uh, but like a lot of things, though, uh, electricity uh, would it work? Would it last? People weren't sure. So they quickly learned how to jury rig what were gas fixtures and make them half electric or half gas. And so by 1905, this fixture was still part gas, but part electric, electric as well at the same time, uh, because it was also uh, rewired. And then they also added 60 new candelabra light fixtures to it. So they went from so slowly but surely, it's becoming less of a gas fixture and more of an electric fixture, which would make it an electrolier. Okay, all right. And that was the last major real conversion of the fixture itself. I think there were a few uh, when um, Assembly Hall was torn down in 1910 to make way for the middle section, which went up in 1911. Actually, it was torn down in 1911. Uh, there might have been a few gas pieces left to it, but by and large, it was a functioning electric fixture at that point in time. Okay, so still massive, as you can see. All right, and this is what the fixture looked like uh, in the 1940s and 50s uh, as a pure chandelier, as we would call today, all right, all electric. And you can see how massive that thing is. It is approximately, oh, close to uh, 18 feet in length and a approximately 10 feet in width at its widest. And it is just a massive, massive fixture. There were 3,000 crystals on it. And of course, why were gasoliers adorned with so many crystals? Well, because the crystals would help take that gas and reflect the light throughout the room itself, right? Um, makes sense, doesn't it? All right, because gas by itself doesn't give off a whole lot of light. I mean, electricity does obviously with light bulbs, but but these crystals would help take that glass and just, you know, through prisms and send it everywhere throughout the room. And that's why you have so many on there right now. Um, but pretty neat looking fixture still, right? And this is what it looked like compared from the 1887 photograph on the left to the 1950s photograph on the right. You can see that it still basically has the same form, but it has changed in some ways, especially towards the top. Uh, I, I, I have no clue how it was attached to the ceiling, shall we say, uh, in 1887, but I do know that when it was moved into Lincoln, what now became Lincoln Hall, uh, it was connected permanently to steel I-beams that were in the ceiling itself. And I know that because I was actually in the ceiling. I looked at it one time, believe it or not. So uh, that's, so that's why I know all that. All right, uh, so it was a, a permanent fixture, so to speak. Okay. All right, another, so just, seeing how Lincoln Hall was used and what we did to the poor fixture as we abused it. I uh, hear it's simply uh, holding up some balloons for a party in Lincoln Hall, you can see. 
And of course, Lincoln Hall, by being the main ballroom itself, uh, we had a lot of weddings take place. And you can see how that fixture is just like a beacon of light for this uh, event, which uh, from all intents and purposes looks like a wedding, right? I'm pretty sure it is from the way it's set up. But from my, uh, good story. Uh, in the early 1990s, when uh, Stanley Orr was a general manager, we decided that we had to refurbish the room a little bit, and that included taking care of the light fixture. It really hadn't been cleaned, I mean, thoroughly cleaned in probably decades. And so the fixture was taken off out of the ceiling and out of the room. And it, uh, we did that in the middle of the summer. And there were, so let's say, six weeks between June and July. And as I recall, and I'm pretty sure my memory's good on this one, there were six weddings lined up over those six weeks, and every wedding rescheduled if they didn't cancel all right because once a wedding in Lincoln Hall without the chandelier, right? So that's how iconic that fixture is and important it is to the image of that room and the league itself. So don't underestimate the power of light fixture. Here we have Lincoln Hall being painted. Uh, and it's just, uh, it was a wonderful scene with just the, the glow of the light coming into the darkened room and that's all just lighting it up. It's really kind of fun, isn't it? Well, there's not some other light fixtures, but not many, but you can see them working on the ceiling and the walls. And uh, you can see how the ceiling looks. It's still that early 1911 ceiling. You see those large air portals or oculi in the ceiling that would be covered up uh, later on by uh, sound panels. And that's what happened here. So this is what the room looked like after it was refurbished, all right? Pretty ugly ceiling, isn't it? Uh, a handsome room. Uh, now this photograph dates from approximately 2006, all right? And we're looking at the south side, the south wall of Lincoln Hall. That'd be the Moravian Street side. But again, you can see how much just the visual space that the chandelier takes up in the room itself. Because what was going to happen is that as the, uh, the league was working through a capital program called Vision 2000, it was refurbishing different parts of the clubhouse um, beginning in uh, 1998, 99. Sleeping rooms, infrastructure, parking garage, sleep, you know, I, uh, the dining rooms, you name it. It was everything was at some point in time uh, redesigned, redecorated, and refurbished. And it was Lincoln Hall's turn in 2012 and 2013. So this is what it looked like as they were beginning to do some of that work, right? Their, the chandelier was going to come down as were the paintings, of course. Everything would come down, including the ceiling. So, and this is that. You can see they're setting up the tables underneath because, there he goes, it's coming down, right? Piece by piece, crystal by crystal, light bulb by light bulb. This is what Lincoln Hall looked like. It was literally nothing but scaffolding uh, with an elevator in the center to get materials up and down to the top floor of the scaffolding. And this is the ceiling. Uh, one of the things that was the biggest change in Lincoln Hall, probably in their whole redesign, was the fact that the ceiling was so was just flat out ugly. And luckily for us and the architects and the interior designer, uh, Barb Everline, by the way, who's a league member, uh, we rediscovered that uh, Horace Trumbauer's drawings from the 1911 building were in the archives, which we knew, but there was also a little sheet dedicated to the ceiling. And so the architect simply took from the original idea and turned it into a 21st century ceiling. And that's what you see here right now, wonderful Beaux-Arts ceiling. And in the very center where that oblong or rectangular panel is, that is where the chandelier is going to be reattached. And this is the cover of the banner. For those of you who are watching and who are not League members, the banner is our monthly magazine. And you can see it's May 2013. Lincoln Hall has reopened after its refurbishment, and there, shining brightly as always, is the chandelier. Okay, and this is what this is what the room looks like. Isn't it? It's just an extraordinary space. Gosh, Trumbauer could do marvels with. I mean, in terms of proportion and scale and everything. The room itself, as you see it, bare is 80 by 80 by 32. So that's be 6,400 square feet and over 200,000 cubic feet of space. And you can see how much room that chandelier takes up. But look at that, and look at that ceiling and how that fixture, I mean, it looks like the two were made for each other, even though the chandelier was designed long before Trumbauer designed that ceiling. But my gosh, it was just made for that space. It was spectacular. And here we're looking on to the north. So that's uh, the north wall, and that would be Samson Street. 
on the outside. And your perspective of the ceiling. Uh, now, one of the things that Barbara Eberlein designed or as part of her redecorating scheme are these four corner pendant chandeliers that were designed in imitation of the large one done by Thackeray and Sons. And here you go to go to, you can see one of them very up close, how it's, it's not meant to be an exact replica, but in the style of, if you will. And they just add wonderfully to the design of the room itself. We have different perspective of the room. That's looking west, because at the far end of the hallway, that is, those are the doors to the library. All right, give us some perspective there. And of course, all the paintings in the room, for those who who aren't league members either and looking at this, those are all past Union League presidents' portraits. Okay. And this is, I think, one of my favorite photographs of all. It's looking up at the bottom of the chandelier from the floor. Isn't that just amazing? That's just amazing stuff, isn't it? So, so there you go. So that was pretty lighthearted, wasn't it? Well, pun, no pun intended. I'm not that smart. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it it's a little something different. Uh, and But it gives you the perspective on the league house itself and how things evolve over time. And it's just, and, and I'll have to go a little deeper in the weeds on that as, as, as we get uh, further along in the series. Okay, we'll see what happens. So, but here we go, lighting the league. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll do more about lighting the league and the league itself in, you know, in the future, obviously. So, so thank you for watching once again. Uh, another, you know, thank you to the Union League Legacy Foundation for sponsoring this series. I hope everybody's enjoying it. I have a blast doing it. I really enjoy it. Uh, and uh, we'll see you next week. So everybody stay safe, stay well, take care, get your vaccine. And that way, we'll see you next week. All right. Adios. Bye now.